Welcome to another episode of the Tasmim Doha podcast. My name is Mikey Mahenna. This is a special episode because I get to talk to somebody who not only I admire tremendously, but also I consider a friend, Dr. Huda Smitzhausen Abifaris, who is the founding director of the Khat Foundation and Khat Books Publishers, and was at Tasmim Doha this past month because she was part of, she moderated a panel discussion called Inner Structures, Outer Rhythms, the Politics of Contemporary Design from the Swana region, and also was a curator of the, the exhibit that matched the same name, Inner Structures, Outer Rhythms. Um, Hoda, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to be back on my Fikta about podcast, and always nice to talk to you. Thank you for having me. Of course. Um, I want to talk, maybe let's start with the the byline or sort of the subline of that exhibit, which is um, Inner Structures, Outer Rhythms, Contemporary Arab and Persian Graphic Design. I kind of want to talk about um, the intentionality of expanding the conversation beyond just Arabic graphic design to include Arabic, Arab and Persian graphic design. Yeah, I I mean the originally the exhibition was was uh, was meant to be for an American audience and um it was important to show work that you know because often Iranians are kind of lumped up as Arabs because they use the Arabic scripts which is not uh, not very accurate historically and not not appealing to a lot of Iranians. Um, so it was really important to kind of specify that in the in the title of the exhibition. Um, it was important to say Persian and not Iranian because also Persian includes a, a wider context than just Iran. But you know the Persianate um, context is is a bit bigger. Um, now the reason they are both in the same uh, exhibition is because I think that there's a lot of uh, cross fertilization between the two cultures. Um, I certainly know that a lot of Arab designers find inspiration in Iranian graphic design. Um, and the reason for that is that in Iran and in, in the Persian world, they stayed a bit closer to the tradition where we kind of had a different, um, yeah, we have a, a bit of a, a, a bit of a distance from our culture or we had for a while and we had lots of influences from a lot of other places especially Western uh, design. So I think that today we find going back to these, you know, so we find inspiration in their work because they are actually are closer to the older traditions and they are very good at taking uh, some of these older traditions and reinterpreting them. Um, and so I think they are kind of a bit of a role model for a lot of uh, Arab designers. Um, and also, I think it was important because, as you know, design is always about politics and there's always these geopolitical problems and divisions in the region. And so bringing people symbolically in the same exhibition, not that the designers have any issues with each other, they all know each other, and get along fine. But it's the statement of bringing two cultures that supposedly are not, um, you know, in sync or that have issues with each other. Yeah. But you know, so it's kind of like a political statement to, to also bring these two uh, cultures into one exhibition and rather focus on the things in common than the things that separate us. How much do you learn during the process of curation? Like Huda, how much does Huda learn when you take on a new project? Yeah, I think, well, I learn a lot, actually. I think what I learn most is first, sometimes I discover new people. So in this case, like, um, I discovered the work of people that I knew from before that I hadn't looked at their work in a long time. Uh, but I also discover, um, you know, when, when you try to explain the work, you actually look at it differently. You kind of look at it more intellectually than just all oh, these are nice works to look at. You, you start to see you know, the meaning behind them, the relations in between them, the complexities where things overlap, where things are different. And it's interesting to put, um, you know, like one thing, for example, that is striking in the exhibition is that Persianate design tends to be very dense, you know, layered, mm. uh, complex, like there's no white spaces, a very colorful, very, yeah, it's like, in, in a way, it's like Persian miniatures or carpets, you know, 
it's the same attitude, not exactly copying that, but it's the same attitude. Whereas if you look at more the Arab uh, designers, it's far more uh, spacious. There's more white space. There's, they're more uh, geometrical. They're more uh, structured. They're a little bit architectural. And they kind of like, it's interesting combination. When you put them together, you really see where things overlap and where things are very different. So I learned from that. I like to reflect on these things and to to see, you know, um, like the, the importance of cultural heritage that we don't always think about, but we kind of internally absorb and express in our work. So the, the so it's like saying, yeah. you know, one is very poetic and the other one is very, I wouldn't say scientific, but maybe like mathematical. Yeah. Okay, so and that kind of speaks of two cultures very nicely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, can I can I rephrase can I rephrase what I think you just said? That almost it's almost as if one is very structural and the other is very musical. And so maybe is yeah. it, is that where the term inner structures, outer rhythms comes from, or are you talking about something else there? No, I, 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 no, I, that's not where it comes from. But now that we're talking, it's probably also related in some ways. Because, of course, you know, like you can't, I mean, I'm working now on another exhibition and, you know, just trying to translate Arabic poetry and philosophy into English is like a, a mind bending exercise. Yeah. Um, and so I think poetry plays an important role in balls. I would say, like, the difference between them would be one is more of uh, like kind of logical intent and the other one, let's say the, the, the one struck one would be not structure as much as in, you know, intent yeah, a logical intent of constructing a, and, and a piece of work. And the other one is a more uh, emotional. So it's like, you know, it's more intuitive in the way it kind of gets constructed together. Um, with the exhibition, the title was really about, you know, uh, in, in, in typography, you have two important aspects, which is the structure that holds the pieces together, that is under the construction of all letters, but also you have the layer above it. So it's like the skeleton is the structure and you have a layer above it that changes, that is the, the outer rhythms, the, the way you know, the strokes are done, the way the letters are dressed up or their, their style. Yeah. And so the idea was also to talk about uh, this idea of structure as being, you know, the script itself, the Arabic alphabet as, as, an, as a structure that holds all these divergent cultures together. And then the, out, the, the way they represent themselves outwardly is this is different and has a different rhythm in different cultures and it also has a rhythm in the sense of you know what it what it how it affects society and the kind of like waves it creates yeah outside of just being you know a visual thing i want to sort of root it in the the structure of the exhibit which is yeah. divided into these like four four segments and maybe or yeah. four themes we go and I'll, I'll read them visualizing rhythm in poetry and music Type and lettering for political activism, designing for culture and the arts, and beyond Arabic calligraphy. And maybe if you if you would, Huda, can you sort of walk us through those four themes and maybe if there's any sort of anything that stands out from each of them that that feels memorable and feels sort of uh um emblematic of the theme? Well, um I I mean I think that the well, I would like to start with beyond calligraphy um, because, I mean, that applies almost to all the works, you know, so it's not about, because we always assume that, or we always associate strongly Arabic script with calligraphy. Yeah. And in this case, it's beyond that because a lot of the work actually challenge uh, calligraphic uh, structures or traditional classical calligraphic forms. And so... A lot of those works, even though they're not as, like the, like you said it clearly, it's a theme and not a section because yeah. it applies across, you know. So in some in some works, it might be that uh, you know the the artist is like, for example, the work of Bahia Shab to take an example, where she does these murals. She explores the 
the plasticity of the Arabic script and creates new forms, new geometrical forms, sometimes not readable or hardly readable. Uh, but so the, the text becomes an image, but the message is very political. So you have these overlaps between the two. Uh, and there are works in the exhibition that are just really purely about, you know, exploring the form. So there's just, you see a, a set of letter forms. There's no meaning behind them. It's just looking at the letter forms, uh, trying to make them into three-dimensional objects, trying to imagine them as collages, trying to break them down into layers, uh, enforce a kind of geometry on them and a grid. So these kind of playfulness are really interesting. And then the theme of politics, of course, is politics. So there's a lot of the works that are, you know, using typography, specifically designing a typeface like the work of uh, Omey Madajani or um, Nadine Shaheen that really design a typeface specifically for use in political protests. Um, so they are bold typefaces that are inspired from like the old handwritten yaftat, you know, the, the kind of like handwritten street uh, uh, protest signs. Um, but of course they make them into a font so it can be used like, you know, for, for people to, to use it in any which way they want. And they have done activism in the sense of distributing these things for free, um, trying to raise money by bringing people together to design fonts. Um, or it can be like a poster, like the work of Nashi Elmir, where he kind of reacts to a political situation and designs a poster. Sometimes they are just out of his, you know, like they have no purpose except to express himself. Yeah. Um, so these are, you know, this is the range of the politics, but you know, you have also, uh, works that so the other theme is is uh, that is very interesting to see here where you see the contrast between the two cultures is this the one on music and poetry yeah because both music and poetry are important to both cultures um but the way that they are expressed in the exhibition you see again um you know like one is uh, for So, for example, a project by a Lebanese group uh, of, of designers uh, t taking jazz and then interpreting it into uh, Arabic lettering. So here you see, you know, the crossover between West and East. Whereas if you look at, um, you know, the the work of uh, Amir Karimian or, or Homa Del Varai, they're, they're talking about, you know, like classical or traditional music and then the, the language is completely different. It's very colorful, it's very complex, it's very, um, it has a different rhythm, yeah? It, it, it really beats yeah. to another rhythm. Um, or the works that we have in the exhibition of Reza Abidini where he really makes, uh, he, he kind of, they're poetic in the sense, they don't, they're inspired from poetry, but you cannot read them, they become form and they are drawings of letters and they are very abstract but they have a music to them, you know, in the way they are composed. And here his work is interesting because it kind of really marries, like, sometimes it's very dense and sometimes it's, so it's very Persian <laughs> dense. Yeah. And sometimes it's very abstract and it's like, you know, a, a, just a blotch in a corner. And these kind of things, I think, are really nice to see them together. The fourth theme is on designing for culture. And that was really... Um, Something that I wanted to show that, you know, um, I mean, there's a lot of cultural developments and it's especially in the Arab world, it's like really booming. And it's really interesting to see what happens when designers work for cultural institutions. How do they represent them? Um, and there you start to see also, so there are three works, you know, three, like four different people, four different designers. Uh, somebody working for Saudi cultural institutions, somebody working for cultural institutions in, in the UAE, uh, in Amman and the region in Beirut. And there you see really a, like a range of aesthetic differences, which is very nice to see because then it, it also shows that in these cultures, the approach to aesthetics and to, to, to yeah, cultural projects is very different. So they, they see themselves differently. So it goes from very abstract to super ornamental to weird, uh, funny, yeah. uh, outrageous. Yeah. I'm curious about the relationship between the meaning 
or or maybe I should say the language in the script and how that sort of changes how you think about the the pieces because or, or I should say sh does that change in a meaningful way like um and can you start to like yeah. move into other other sort of languages and scripts is is, is there something that ties them aside from the shape of the letters? Uh, no, I mean, of course, the, the connection to the language is important. I mean, also there is a crossover in language also between Persian and Arabic uh, because of, you know, because of Islam and because of adopting certain Arabic words into the Persian language. And because also, I think historically, these cultures have always been mixing for like thousands of years. So it goes really a long way back, um, even pre-Islamic. But I don't know if in the, I mean, it depends on the pieces. Like I said, some pieces are very abstract and they're not about language. And some pieces are really about bringing a message across. And there, I think the relationship between the script and the, and the text is important because the way you design the text helps you read this, the meaning or the way you design the text, the choice of fonts, the choice of letters, the choice of aesthetic also adds an important, you know, element to the meaning. Yeah. So how you read it, how you react to it. Uh, and I don't know, I mean, sometimes also there's a disconnect between intention and, and reception. So when a designer has a, an idea and they express it, it's not always read the way they think that it might be read. Like it's, we all hope that it would be, but it's not always possible because uh, when people look at a script, um, we always have, so it's like when looking at any images, actually, you have an association to a certain experience you've had. And so you cannot cover everybody's experiences yeah. because they are different from one person to another. So what they, what might be very common in one culture might look very exotic in another. And I'm talking about in the region, not like, you know, another culture altogether. Do you feel like, are there, are there people that you're aware of that are breaking rules? Cause it's, it's funny. I feel like when it comes to, um, I was watching, I was watching the panel, right? I was, at, yeah. I had the privilege of being at Tasmim, um, watching the panel with you and Wa'ed. And speaking of the the Jazz and Ink um, series, for the, anyone watching the YouTube video, that's that thing that I'm pointing to that's, right now. Yeah, is part that's of, Wa'ed's behind that's you, Wa'ed's, right? Uh, Wa'ed's uh, yeah. submission as that series. Um, yeah. So during the panel, I was thinking to myself a lot that sometimes I feel like... Um, some of the artists and designers and thinkers that are contributing to um, these, this sort of, this moment, I wonder mm. how many rules they are breaking and how interested they are in breaking quote unquote rules and sort of expressing themselves beyond the, beyond what is supposed to be allowed versus kind of reinforcing and almost celebrating and idolizing the rules from centuries past. Um, I, I wonder how uh, many people are sort of really like thinking outside the box and saying, you know what, none of this is, none of this is uh, precious. All of this is up for debate. All of this is, it can be broken. I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, that's a good uh, question. It's a very good question. Um, I think it's a lot of people, even when they say they find inspiration in the old, in the tradition. Yeah. And that's, like I said, it's a recent thing and it's a sort of reaction to like the hegemony of other cultures over our culture. So it's yeah. a kind of like reclaiming your own cultural heritage. But that doesn't mean you're not, you're following a rules as you call them. Yeah. Because... Um, none of, I mean, a lot of these designers cannot follow the rules because they've never even been trained in them. So it's really like, you don't know, you, yeah, you, you don't, don't know, know the rules breaking. to even break them. Yeah. <laughs> what a matter. privilege. What a, what, what a, a privilege, superpower. Right. But I think, for example, in, 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 
in, in, in cultures like, again, speaking of Iran and after the Islamic uh, Republic took over, whatever you call it, I'm sorry, I don't know the terminology here. Yeah. Uh, but the current government, you know, the, 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 the forcing of people to actually uh, take calligraphy as part of your curriculum makes, it, makes them have a very different relationship and maybe there you see more of a struggle of breaking the rules mm. than, let's say, in countries like in Lebanon, where nobody knows how to write Arabic properly. I mean, by hand, like, you know, not the content. Uh, and if you've ever studied it in school, you probably had a teacher that has also no idea how to write it properly. So you don't have a calligraphic um, education. And so for you to, be, to learn the rule, you really have to get out of the way and learn the rules. Yeah. Um, and then explore how you can break them. But you start by actually not knowing what you are doing. So it's a kind of like, I think it dif it's different. I don't think you can generalize. There are people that are um, intentionally breaking the rules, uh, but it takes time. It's like first you have to learn and then unlearn and then come up with something new. And again, you know, it differs where you are, what were your background. Um, if you grew up in a sort of where your education was mostly in Arabic, your relationship to the script is very different. So if I look at the works of designers from Jordan, they really don't break the rules. They really stick to, but you know, that could change also. Yeah. Um, so I know also Jordanian calligraphers that are really very free in the way they do things. And so I think it's... Um, the, the rules are not as defined as people think they are, yeah. I think. I wonder, do you think, do you think we are, you know, like when people study art of any, any medium, music, film, doesn't matter, uh, visual arts, um, in retrospect, they, they sort of attribute, they ascribe names to moments in time, right? Like let's yeah. using, uh, uh, let's use like jazz as an example. They'll say this is the bebop era or this is the cool era yeah. or this is the um, swing or whatever it is. If you were to describe the last 50 years, are there clear eras in Arabic, in the world of Arabic typography um, that you say, okay, yeah, the 60s were really this. And then the sev after 75 or after 79, this happened and after the 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 um, advent of you know uh photoshop this happened i mean are there are there moments yeah, yeah. and are we in a moment are we definitely in a moment and there has been moments i mean i think for example the 60s 70s 80s there was designers that were also not trained as designers but trained as visual artists and they actually used the script as just like like the paintings they do. So it's very personal. It's very, you know, not dividing by rules per se. Um, so there was a lot of experimentation. Some, you know, some work stands out from that period. Uh, then you had the period of, you know, the, the printing press and sort of mechanized things. And that was kind of, you know, like running parallel to that. So you had two forms of text to read and text to used for posters and in a very expressive way. Uh, then the computer age was a very kind of, at the beginning was a very sad moment. I would say. <laughs> there was oh, lots why, of bad why fonts. Sad mo oh. There were lots of terrible typefaces. Is that just because it could to... only handle like right angles? No, 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 no. It was just, just, I don't know. There was no, there was a disconnect between technicians and designers and artists and, and calligraphers working together. There are some exceptions. I can't say it's across the board, but they are really like it's one company, one person, you know, sort of thing. Exception. I mean, really, that's an exception. What are the, exception. What are the years of this period? That's the, uh, that's the, uh, the 90s, basically, early 2000s, 90s. And then after the 2000s, you know, the technology, I think there's, there was also... Well, actually, more like mid two thousands, things turned because the technology allowed the designers to work in a more uh, organic, normal way. Let's say not too technical, so that you can actually work freely, draw, and then it's automatically what you draw is what you see, and yeah, 
um, and then that, you know, it, it facilitated a lot of things. And then, I don't know, then, um, you know, we've been uh, telling people for 20, the past 25 years, you should, or 20 years, you should really do something about the script. You should really design your own script. You should not wait for technicians. You should not wait. And it sunk at some point. Mm. Like people actually started to get courageous. The technology made it easier, but also the younger generation just find designing typefaces really fun and cool, which was, which is good. So a lot of things in the beginning of that period, there was a lot of monsters, like really mm. strange stuff coming out. But then, you know, it just, it developed and now we are, I would say like, it's a, it's a new renaissance for, for Arabic typography. It's really beautiful to see. It's interesting though, because for me, it's whenever I speak to somebody who cares about typography and cares about the Arab world, there's one thing that I feel like they is never talked about, <laughs> which, uh -oh. <laughs> which is maybe because I'm just not in the rooms where the, that thing is talked about, or maybe it just goes without saying, um, both of which are totally plausible, which is so what, uh, this is why I want to ask you about it. I feel like there's very little conversation that I'm exposed to that is about how the script or how the typeface or how the, the words on the page, how easy they are to read. Um. Like the transmission of idea to, to, to visual, to communicate the idea of this being a mechanism for communication yeah. of complex words, sentences, paragraphs, and idea, you know, text, um, with the idea of how interesting and visually compelling it is to look at yeah. almost seems to be completely divorced. Uh, uh, no, I, I don't, I don't think so. So I maybe mean, I I'm not that, in the right room. So tell me how those things are linked. No, I mean, I, I think there are people that are totally focused on that. Uh, and I think that there's two sides to this story. There is, you know, there's no such thing as legibility in the abstract. We all have different eyes. We have different, like I said, different experiences with text, different experiences in within within our culture different reading experiences so and that affects what you consider legible so i give you a, a simple example if you were born in 1930 the the script that you would find most legible is the script you've you've read all your life in your textbooks in your newspaper and so any change to that slows down your reading it looks strange and you don't like it, you know? Mm. So when, when we did the first typographic matchmaking project, you know, we had a range of fonts, I mean, very different from each other. Five type, say, typeface families, completely different. And the spectrum, there was one that was closest to the traditional NAS, what, what people really see every day for the, or have been seeing every day for the longest part for reading long text. And you have the other extreme, which is more like simplified, modern, uh, Kufi-like uh, typeface that is, um, was very fresh at the time and definitely was often used, traditionally used as titling and never for long texts. Um, and I remember when I made this book, I really went as far as typesetting all the text in these different typefaces. And it was very interesting to kind of show these book, this book to different people. And the, the younger they are, the more they, they tended to, ha to find the simplified modern looking one most legible. Mm -hmm. And the older they were, they found the more complex you know, legible. So it's just a matter of what they're used to reading, basically or not reading, because I think the younger generation don't read as much. So they're looking at this, they're like, oh, I like it. It's really easy to read. It's clear. Huh? It's not too complicated, not too. But then there's another side to it. And this is kind of more the ideological side of saying, well, these very simplified script don't look Arabic enough to some people. And so they are not legible. They are kind of monsters. They are Frankensteins. Um, and so, the tendency today is to kind of 
you know, marry the two somehow, yeah. bring some combination of the two where the text becomes readable for everyone, really, and not looking too old. So, you know, going back to your story, this discussion of, you know, how far can you go where it becomes too foreign looking? It's still readable, but it's foreign looking, so it's not comfortable reading. So it's not easy reading. Yeah. And where do you retain some innovation and maybe some clarity or modern twist to the, the traditional forms? And we are at this stage, you know, there's a lot of typefaces nowadays that kind of combine the two because you do need both, actually. You need the classical, but you need to also, uh, like you said, it's about communication. So you have to also be able to communicate a modern or a fresh or a young or whatever, you know, tone of voice. Um, and so that's important as well. Yeah. So this discussion to just mm -hmm. wrap up yeah. is an ongoing discussion in type design history from in all scripts, yeah. in all types. Like it's the classical conversation, you know, of how, how far can we push it and how, how, when is it good? When is it bad? Can we do this? Can we do that? How far can we break the rules? Yeah. Where does innovation starts to be, uh, too pro too dominant that it's no longer communicating kind of okay i want to ask you about higher education um a lot of disciplines in, in sort of the humanities um are having existential crises when it comes mm -hmm. to the role the utility the purpose of um higher education to establish people as um, contributing members of their society and being able to equip them with the skills they need to have viable careers. Um, and this is really across the board. Um, and I'm curious how the world of graphic design and design maybe more broad, uh, broadly in typography um, has, is, um, is faring in this moment. And so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll put you in a situation, uh, a hypothetical situation, and see how you would respond to this. So let's say okay. a 17-year-old consults you for advice. They love typography. They love design. They're huge fans. They came, in, they came and saw your exhibit. They sat in on the panel, and they said, I love this. I think I want to be a typographer. Um, mm -hmm. Should I study graphic design? You know, do I need to study graphic design in university? Do I need to major in this? Can I study English literature or history or, or Japanese, Japanese literature? Like, do I need to study this in university? Is this the right thing to do? And if I study this, is it going to be relevant whatever I study today in 10 years? What would you say to this person? Uh... Well, what I used to say to my students, I think, um, yes, it will be relevant because if you, if you, because studying is not about just building skills, it's about also learning how to learn, um, learning how to adapt, uh, learning principles that apply, you know, through the centuries. So I am in my late 50s. And still, when I design, I have a few of my teachers that I had when I was 18 in my head when I work. And their advice still is relevant, although I work in a complete different medium. I even, some, I mean, I am not only designing, but also curating an exhibition or having a talk or doing a research. And that still resonates, even if it's about an advice on, you know, a very specific way of organizing information on a page. It applies to something else. So I think that it takes maturity at, you know, and time for you to realize that what you learn is something you learn. Uh, it, it will be useful in many different contexts. It's not, of course, you know, there are certain things that, uh, for example, are not relevant as such, but they are always relevant. Even like learning a computer skill, you know, a software. Once you learn it, um, you actually learn the principles of it. So when it upgrades, when you start to, you know, teach yourself a new software, you know, you already have like the shoes on to run, basically. Mm -hmm. So I think 
Yes, I would advise a, a graphic designer or a, desi a young person who's interested in designing uh, to take a design course, to take a design program. Graphic design is helpful to learn typography. But of course, you know, in the end, they learn principles and what they have to learn is something they have to teach themselves as they go. And it will never stop. It's like, you know, you, you learn until you die, basically. You're always learning something new. So the idea that you, that young people have often is that when they go into college, they get a degree, then they have it all. Like, and that's just not true. Yeah. They only have like the beginning. They just got the shoes. Now they have to get their muscles to do all the rest of the work. Not even the socks, not just the shoes. Just the shoes. <laughs> have to buy your own socks. <laughs> and sometimes they buy your own laces as well. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what your experience at Tasmi was like. Um, I really love this conference. I mean, I'm not saying it because I'm on this talk, but I really do. I think it has uh, the few times that I've been there and this time is no difference. Like, it's always... What I love about it is that it brings different disciplines together. And, you know, sometimes when you're older and you, like know too many people, you kind of have a feeling that you've heard these stories before, you know, but you get bored very easily. And what's nice of being in a, in a situation where people come from different disciplines is you always have a feeling you learn something new. And I really enjoyed the talks that I could attend. Um, and I thought also that, you know, this idea of workshops and making together is really important. I mean, I, I didn't participate in any workshop, but I could see that from the people that participated that it was really very inspiring. So I think, yeah, I really, and I, I really like being in Doha because nice weather, good yeah. food, nice museums. So the whole experience was very pleasant, actually. Yeah. I love it. Okay, I want to end on um, uh, putting you on the spot with some recommendations. Um, okay. So whether they are designers who were part of the exhibit that you curated or other people who you think have uh, offer a lot to learn from, um, can you uh, put together a list of like five designers or artists or people who are publishing right now that you think people should go check out because their work is um will will offer a lot of uh learning that's really mean question <laughs> i know i mean you know this about me Hoda. i'm a, I'm mean, a mean person I, I, people always ask me when i make a submission who is your favorite i'm like they're all my favorite otherwise they wouldn't be here like it's really hard to you know, to no choose. favorites, no favorites, just ones that um are worth somebody's walking down the street they're listening to this on the subway they're in a in between meetings. They should check them out. So we can't be the people out. that already are very well known because then you know them, right? Maybe not. I think. I mean, I think. I think that you know the works of people that really I, are worth checking out would be for me from the exhibition. If I can think of people from the exhibition, people that are not so well known, or and they are known, but they are. They are remarkable in what they do is somebody like Jana Trabulsi. I think what she does on publication design is really remarkable. I find it, yeah, fascinating, her work on the magazine Bidayat, on her own artist books. Um, and that, that work stands out. It's very personal and it's very, yeah, poetic. So that's a Great. person that probably is more known for our illustration work, which is also beautiful, but I think her publication work deserves more more attention. Another uh, person in the exhibition who is uh, very, yeah, I think shy in some ways, but whose work is really remarkable is Karim Feder. Um And I don't think you will find him online, so tough luck. <laughs> so that's also a difficult person to follow. I, I'm I'm going to pick the people that are difficult to find. How about that? Like that they are that's not great. available as easily online. Somebody like Lara Aswad, who's done uh, really remarkable work in in letter in in you know designing new alphabets that are based on this idea of modularity, but then 
you know, here you see also again this combination of getting inspired from traditional forms, very, very ancient scripts, and then interpret them into a complete unique and uh, almost, yeah, intellectual, not almost, in, in an intellectual way and in, into a new form. Then, of course, you know, there are the famous people and um, that you can look them up, like, you know, Studio Kaga, that make beautiful work, Homa del Barai, blah, blah, blah. I think someone from Iran who is not as well known is uh, in, outside of Iran is Amir Karimian, and he is also really remarkable. He's been working, um, he, he, he's, he works in lettering and in, in poster design in a way that is very uh, free. So every mm. time it's a different, you know, there's no style. It's just like reacting to, to, the, to the content. And recently he's been working on kind of making um, like technologically on animated posters, but really beautiful where the lettering kind of morphs and you almost see how he designs these letter forms and they morph from one shape to another. And so his work is really nice. You can find him on Instagram. He's Instagramable. I think Jana is, I don't know if she has really her best work on Instagram. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Do you, um, do you like curating? How does it feel to, to curate? Is it part of your brain that you enjoy? I kind of fell into it. Uh, I see it as, yeah, yeah I, I think my brain really enjoys it to kind of bring, you know, uh, works that... Like it's, it's like, for me, it's like designing books, but then in 3D space. So telling a story through the works, bringing them together and making, bringing out, you know, some, another layer to them that is not maybe originally intended by the designers. Or when you put them next to other works, there's something else that happens that brings another dimension. And I like these kind of uh, discoveries. I enjoy it. Yeah. I feel like it would be. I mean, you are a very curious person. I wonder if it sort of brings out a part of you that's just like, you know, looking under the under the under the rocks <laughs> and under the logs for um, for diamonds. for new yeah for diamonds exactly for new things. And I wonder if it's your your curation is less curation and more expedition. Well, I sometimes think it's more like, uh, which is another thing that I'm really interested in, it's more like archaeological excavations. Mm. That's how I describe also all my research. It's like excavation. It's there and you just have to dig deep. And But I think the curation is really when, I mean, it's not just discovering the things, but it's also how you make them talk in a different mm. context because you take them out of their natural context. Graphic design work is often has a very, like, each piece has its own context and its own purpose. And when you take that away, what happens? You know, it's not art. It doesn't necessarily stand for itself. So the bringing them together has to be very careful. Like what happens when they are next to another work from another culture, from another time frame, from another generation? What are you trying to say with that? So I think I enjoy doing that. I mean, that's not possible in a book because yeah. it's much more linear. So that's also the, what I like is that you can, it's like a book you can read in any direction and in a personal way, like it's not dictated to you. It's not, you know, this is the author telling you what to think or what they think. Yeah. It's more, I suggest a context and then you can, you know, play in it and, you know, write your own stories as you experience the works. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, like, what is the worst thing somebody could say to you in response to an exhibit you've curated? I'm going to give you a couple options. You tell me if one of them is the worst. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that helps. One is I hated it. That I, would be I not absolutely nice. hated. No. Right? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> but one is I. I'll tell you what you asked them. Hey, what did you think of the exhibit? And they said, to be honest, I hated it. I have very strong opinions about it. I hated it. I hated what you're trying to say. I'm offended by it. Completely thought it was terrible. Bad okay. reaction. The other one is kind of indifferent. It's nice. Nice. What, what is worse? Uh, probably the indifferent, I think. 
Yeah, I mean, it also depends on the person, really, like who's saying it. But I hated it would be like shocking, I think. And so nobody ever says that. I mean, maybe in the Netherlands, they would come up and say to you, I hate your work. But I mean, yeah. in the Arab world, they're very polite. So indifference yeah. or sometimes saying, oh, it's nice, means they didn't like it. Uh, mm. But I've had before somebody walk into an exhibition I made and said, you know, they didn't say I didn't I hate it. They said something uh, more more interesting. <laughs> if I say it, they yeah. said the work was dangerous, mm. and I thought, oh, I like that. That was a compliment. Yeah, that was not meant as a compliment, but as far as I'm concerned, that was a compliment. I like being dangerous. Yeah. In real life, I'm completely harmless, so that was nice <laughs> to be dangerous for a change. <laughs> Without Helps having to carry any weapons or any like yeah. deadly whatever. It's because I, I wonder, like, as you're putting something this, uh, putting something like this together, you're, I would imagine that you have a very intentional message that you are maybe not a message that you're trying to convey, but a the start of a conversation that you're trying to have. It's almost like a prompt. You're, you're yeah. trying to get people to begin this conversation yeah you're prompting it right yeah and um and the result of that conversation good or bad maybe is beyond your control and and you understand that and you say okay if you hate it or you yeah. hate it you love it you love it that's a different thing but um i would imagine that a lot of people see exhibitions like this and come out saying come out unprompted maybe is the word well, I mean, I think they come out with their often they come up come out with their own uh, with their own ideas about it. Hmm. So I don't think anybody. I mean, unless they're really not sincere, they walk through it and then that's fine. You know, and they don't see anything; they're not interested. Uh, but like, I think a lot of people react to certain works more than others. I don't know if people. Uh, consciously realize what it means to place the works in facing, you know, facing each other, or whether they look at them. Often people look at them as individual things. But I think somehow, subconsciously, I think the messages do come across. And it's very, um, it's very interesting that a title of an exhibition kind of flavors how you look at the exhibition. Just the title, mm -hmm. even if you don't read all the, you know, the explanations. Uh, so I think it's also an art form to write the right title. And sometimes if the title is ambiguous, then you are trying really to prompt people to think for themselves and think, what does this mean? What, what are they trying to say? Often titles are very descriptive and you kind of know ahead of time. So I try to avoid that personally. I find, yeah, I find that bringing out people's curiosity gives me pleasure because that also how I enjoy art out of curiosity you know i don't like to read the text explaining what the artwork is about until i've seen the exhibition then i return and i read it because i don't want the curator to tell me what to think of the artworks but a lot mm. of people read every single thing you know they need this guidance so it's just and both are fine yeah. i mean it's it's individual in the end how you experience art yeah um, Huda, this was so much fun. Yeah, likewise. I love, I always love talking to you. Thank you. Um, and I should say that if you love the sound of Huda's voice, you should listen to the Chat <laughs> podcast, Chat Chronicles, um, which I'm a big fan of. It's part of the Afikra family of podcasts. And um, uh, I love having you on. I obviously am such an admirer of your work and you are very much an inspiration. So... It's an honor having you on. Thank you. Anything. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you. You're very kind. So if you haven't checked out the rest of these episodes on the Tasmin podcast, uh, please do so. Um, look us up on YouTube or Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you find your podcasts. Uh, thanks, Uda. Thank you. Bye. Have a lovely day.